I'm curious, what do you think are the the four or five key habits of magnetic individuals who can communicate clearly and get incredible results from conversations and relationships, whether they're introverted or extroverted? What are those four key habits that make them magnetic and enrolling and captivating to get things done? Yeah. No matter what personality type they have. Um, I think one of the key habits, and we've talked about this already, is knowing what you want. You know, knowing what you want to ask for. And that immediately makes you quite different from other people because a lot of people are like, they're in a commu com commu conversation and they're communicating, but I'm like, but where are we, what the point? <laughs> and if you can get really clear on the request you have and, and the hope you have as an outcome, that is an extremely charismatic yeah. and powerful place to stand. And how would you set that up? Is that like the intention behind it or saying it right away? Is it like knowing what you want in your mind but not saying it or saying, this is what I want? The, the hard work is to know what you want. Uh -huh. Then you negotiate and you navigate the moment in front of you and the person. Like you, you, you've got to play, that, play the person, not just the, the cards in your hand. What's helpful for me is to tease apart in any conversation, not just what do I want, but what are the facts and what is the feelings and what are the interpretation of the facts? And I think people who are charismatic in how they communicate often have an ability of not getting all that sort of stuff squished together, which is what happens to most of us. So I know that for me to be in conversation with you, and if I'm trying to um, move something forward or change something, it's really helpful for me to know the data and the facts of the situation. What's amazing? is that there's almost always very little data. <laughs> Most of what we're experiencing about a situation is this combination of our feelings and our judgments. And most of what knocks us off of being magnetic and being charismatic and kind of being compelling like that is the fuzziness of some of our judgments and our feelings in terms of actually how we then communicate. So I'm always going, okay, what are the facts? I need to know those. What feeling and judgment combination is most powerful for me to express that serves me and them and the situation. Because a lot of my judgments aren't that helpful. Often my judgments are like, we're a loser, this is a disaster, why am I here, I should never have signed up for this, this is going south, this is never gonna get anywhere. I mean, all of that sort of negative self-talk going on. But if I'm like, you know, giving somebody feedback perhaps, I'm like, look, I'm frustrated because I'm not sure you understand how important this is. That's a feeling and judgment combination. Really helpful. Particularly then I go, so here's what I want. Like, I'm sad because it feels like we're stuck and I'm not quite sure how we're going to get out of this. So what, I'm com what, I, what I want is for us to go see a therapist together to get support to work through this sort of stuff. And this idea of going, how do you learn how to add the, the depth of feeling and emotion to owning your judgments to asking for what you want can be a really compelling way of actually communicating in a way that feels magnetic and authentic and grounded and and human. Wow. Okay. What's what's the next habit? Um, some of this is um, self management, and um, this got taught to me by a friend of mine called Mark Bowden. He runs a company called Truth Plane. He's a fantastic TEDx talk on this yeah. as well, and particularly if you're in front of a crowd. How you use your body and how you use your hands in particular is a, a very influential way on how the, the, the uh, a crowd will feel, feel about you. So the language he gives me is, be the strongest signal in the room because the crowd will respond to the strongest signal in the room. They will feel what you feel. They will be who you want to be. So I'm like, great. So how do I want my, my audience to feel? And you know, often for me, I'm, I want them to feel encouraged and to feel loved and feel awesome and feel light, like a, a playfulness. So I'm thinking about that in terms of what I am bringing to, to my presence. And then what Mark taught me was these three different positions you can use to communicate. And it's about where you put your hands, particularly in front of a stage. And the, the, the critical one is the truth plane. And he calls that, it's like, keep your hands at your belly button level. 
Because actually, that is the most vulnerable expression you can have. Because you're basically saying, look at me, this is my weak spot. My belly's my weak spot. I'm showing it to you. And this is because the body leads the brain. So the brain go, the body goes, if you're showing him that your most vulnerable spot, you must feel safe and you must feel confident and you must feel relaxed. And that makes you feel safe and confident and relaxed. And because you're the strongest signal in the room, the audience feels safe and confident and relaxed. And then if I want to shift the energy in the room, I'll just lift my hands up. So you can see that just by going like this, even though I haven't changed the content at all, actually the experience has actually shifted a little bit. And if I really want to make a point, I'll lift my hands right up here and everyone's like, I don't know why I'm feeling so good right now, but for some reason I'm feeling good right here. I'm like, I'm just saying the same stuff, but I've just lifted my hands up. But now I'm down here, suddenly we've become a little more intimate and a little more vulnerable and a little more human around that. So for me, this, this is stagecraft, which is like in yeah. these subtle ways, you prime an audience to respond to the strongest signal in the room, which means you have to get your signal clear, mm. which means you have to have an intention about how you want the audience to feel. And you have to have the, 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 the movement on stage to actually reflect that. That's a good idea, yeah. Um, and then there's a third thing I might add. So there's something really powerful about priming. So to say, see how you're nodding your head right there? That's a classic priming move. So if I go, Lewis, look, I'm about to tell you something here and you're going to really love this. What's happening is you're nodding your head. People at home are nodding their head as well. And they're like, I don't even, why, why am I doing this? <laughs> why am I, why am I, I already love this and he hasn't yeah. even told me. And there's a way that you can use language to help your audience understand and appreciate what's about to happen. How? This is going to be fantastic. I think you're going to really like what I'm about to tell you now. That's it. That's me priming. The audience doesn't even hear it, but I'm just giving them a chance to get their brain to be ready and to hear it in an open-hearted, open-minded way. Sure. It's like, this might be the best thing I've got to tell you all day. All right. The second thing is going to be fantastic. What is it? Is yeah. that? This second thing is going to be fantastic. And... You know, it's this fine line between like, I am, I am manipulating an audience when I'm doing this. I'm working really hard to give them the very best chance to get the very most out of what I've got to share with them so that they feel present and served and I, I've done my best contribution to them. And I'm doing all of that to kind of be in an act of service. And you know, all of these things can be used for evil as well. So sure. you're like... You, it's your intention is significant in this. Right. Okay. I love these habits so far. Would there be one more habit that would make someone a magnetic communicator and roller and force for good? Well, here's, here's my preference, Lewis, and this is a bit kind of off the path, but when I am working with, uh, if I'm presenting or running a workshop or speaking to a large crowd, I get... I spend a lot of time getting the audience to speak to itself. How do you do that? I say, turn to the person next to you. <laughs> like, this is how I start a, this is how I start a keynote. I'm like, um, I ask them some check-in questions. I go, first of all, on a scale of one to seven, how active do you plan to be with me over the next 90 minutes? And they're like, oh. And I'm like, I don't mind what number you choose. You're, you can choose. You're an adult. I'm not bullying you into a seven. Yeah, yeah. But like, one is, I'm right at the back. I'm planning on having a nap. I'm hoping to get my pulse rate down into the low 30s. I didn't even want to be here. <laughs> Seven is like, I'm stoked to be here. I'm so excited. This is the talk I've been hearing. Fantastic. And then my second question is, I like, score one to seven. How much risk are you will take with me over the next 90 minutes? I don't mind what it is. You choose. But one is no risk at all. I'm hoping to think nothing new, learn nothing new, meet anybody new. I'm hoping this whole thing doesn't affect me at all. Seven, on the other hand, is like, you know, I have poor personal boundaries. You know, I'm going to talk about the incident from my child. I'm talking about my inner child's wounds and how that still makes me cry. When we do the naked thing, I'm going to be taking all my clothes off. That's a seven. Everybody laughs. If you can get an audience to laugh early on, they form as a group and they like you more. They feel safer. That's great. And then the third uh, question I ask is, on a scale of one to seven, how much do you care about the experience of the other people in the room with you here? One is... I hate these people. This is a nightmare. I'm at this greatness conference and I'm trapped. I don't even like any of these people. I've got, I thought this was an automobile conference. I don't know what I'm doing here. Seven on the other hand is like, I love these people. These are my people. I'll do what I can to contribute to the, the group. 
So I'm inviting people to show up. In some ways, it's a version of how to work with almost anyone, which is like, let's have a conversation about how we be together before we get into the work. Mm, that's cool. And I'm priming them to kind of go, look, I'm, gonna, I want, I'm making a decision on how I'm showing up. I'm making a decision on how much risk I'm taking. I'm making a decision about how I contribute because they hadn't really thought of it before they sat down. They were just there because it said, be in this room at nine o'clock for the, the opening yeah. keynote. Right. I, I'm, and, I, and they're kind of in passive re re recipient mode. Yeah. And then I'm like, now get up and go and find a partner. And I often ask one or two questions. It's like, talk about the high point of the week for you. Person with the longest hair goes first. Give them really kind of sure. certainty about who goes first. And the buzz in the room lifts because everyone's talking about a, a high point. It's an I thou conversation right there. And so far, I've taught no content. We're now 10 to 12, 15 minutes into a 90 minute speech. So I've given up a lot of time. But you've built connection. But I've built connection. I've given the audience autonomy. I've given them a sense of being seen and heard. They've often met somebody new that they haven't met before. And they think I'm brilliant. And you haven't done anything. Well, I have. You I've got, said I've got, out, I've got all, out of the spotlight and I said, let me put the spotlight on you yeah, to brilliant. remind you how great you are. That's so brilliant. you can see how this is a scaled up version of what we were saying earlier on about how coaching shifts the conversation from me having the authority yeah. to having you picking some stuff out and giving you the authority. That's and powerful. So I'm constantly going, how do I hand authority and power to other people? Not least because, you know, I'm a straight, white, best-selling author, road scholar, tall, devastatingly handsome, blah, blah. I've got, I've got all the, the kind of the cards of power and privilege. So my job is to go, how much can I give away, how quickly, so that I can invite other people in to, to have some of that? Because I've got a lot of that I can give away without diminishing who I am. That's really smart and a good habit to do because I, I learned early on, not by choice, but because, well, I guess kind of by choice, I didn't have any other choice, that when I was early on going to conferences and events and networking outings, I didn't think I was smart or intelligent or had anything to offer. Right. I didn't think I had any skills. I didn't think I... I didn't have the confidence to actually like tell my own story, none of that stuff. And so I got really good at just asking other people questions and kept following up the next question and never saying anything about myself. Right. And by the end of the night, people were like introducing me to everyone, <laughs> like this is the most interesting guy here and I didn't right. say anything. Right. I mean, I said questions, but I didn't talk about You were me. interested in them, which makes you interesting exactly. to them. Yeah. The most yeah. interested person in the room becomes the most interesting. I think and so. And when you become interested in your audience, having value, connecting, feeling yeah. great, you become more interesting right. to them and they were, are more likely to listen to you. Exactly. I think that's a powerful habit uh, in really connecting deeper and allowing yourself to work with almost anyone, people who are willing. Yeah, yeah to participate actively in that. And that's a lot about what your book is about, how to work with almost anyone, which is the five questions we were just going over for building the best possible relationships. And as you know, and as our audience knows that the quality of our life is directly related to the quality of our relationships, the conversations, the emotions, the feelings, the experiences you have in those relationships. And that's why this is all about having deeper, better, more fulfilling relationships. And so your book covers that. Also, The Coaching Habit, which is sold over a million copies, helps people have better conversations and, and just have more tools and skills for learning how to connect better with people of all walks of life. I want people to make sure they get the books. Uh, we'll link it all up. What, it, what else is, uh, are we missing here? Is there anything else that people need to know or here to support them and deepening their relationships, accelerating their life in a positive way and having everything they want. Well, I'm gonna say two things. One is a bit more tactical, which is around, well, what is the best possible relationship? And we've kind of covered it, but just wanna nail it for people. It has three elements. It needs to be safe, which you've talked a lot about and the importance of that. It needs to be vital, which means it needs to have life and it needs to be repairable. So safe and, and repairable, I think we've talked about, but 
I just want to point out that psychological safety is so important, but I don't want a relationship that's just psychologically safe. I want a relationship where I can also be psychologically brave, and that's the vitality. And in any relationship, you know, you with your partner, me with my partner, me with the people who run my companies, I'm trying to build our version of a relationship that is safe and vital and repairable. And they're different with each relationship because it's a unique relationship. But I want that right combination. Mm, that's so cool. that's kind of a tactical level. Yeah. And then if I, if I was to ask anything of this audience, it would be to be the people who are brave enough to start this. You know, we've talked a few times about the power of reaching out. Um, somebody said the other day to me, nobody likes the first, to be the first person to say hello. Everybody loves to be greeted. And one of the responses people have to this idea of having a keystone conversation, a conversation about how we work together, not what we're working on, is like, that feels like it's going to be a bit awkward. And I'm like, it probably will be yeah. a bit awkward. I'm not, I'm not, it's like, you don't have a role model, you probably haven't experienced it before. But to be the person who is brave enough to say, hey, before we get into it, or we've been in it for a while, but let's just take a beat and actually stop and look across the table at each other like we're doing and go, how can we work better together for our sakes, for our happiness, but also for the success of the work we're doing? Yes. What would that be like? And so what I hope is people have the bravery to kind of reach out. That's beautiful. And I, we'll, we'll make the call to action to people right now. My friend Jesse Itzler says every day he reaches out to three people in his life and asks them interesting questions and gets them to open up. And so I would say to everyone listening or watching, um, you know, to reach out to at least one person a day, send them a text, ask them one of these questions, check in on them, see how they're doing, and let me know in the comments if they uh, if they reply and what sparks from you reaching out and have that courage and that bravery. to see this. So, I'm excited to dig into the comments exactly, too and see yeah. what happens from this. I think some magic's about to happen. Exactly. Uh, Michael, again, I want to make sure people get the book, How to Work with Almost Anyone. Make sure you guys take take a look at this, get a copy of that in The Coaching Habit. You're at mbs.works, mbs underscore works on Instagram and all over the place on social media. We'll have all this linked up. Uh, you guys can go to Amazon and get the books as well and see everything there. Um, this is a question I ask everyone towards the end of our conversations. It's called the three truths. Yeah. So imagine you get to a, live as long as you want and accomplish and experience all that you want. But for whatever reason, it's the last day for you on earth. Okay. Many years away. Yeah. And for whatever reason, in this hypothetical scenario, you have to take all of your work with you. Yeah. So no one has access to this conversation. Right. Any book you've ever written or will create. Yeah. It all goes somewhere else. Yeah. But you get to leave behind three lessons to the world, three things you know to be true from all your experiences that you would want to share as lessons for others. <laughs> Such what, a good question. What would those three uh, lessons be for you? Um, the three lessons for me would be stay curious longer because magic starts to unlock when you can stay curious longer. You, you see something new in the people you're curious with. You see the world differently when you're curious. The second lesson would be we unlock our greatness by working on the hard things. So I think that's probably a theme that, that resonates loudly here, but it's like, you know, having the courage to step out to what I would call a worthy goal, something that's thrilling and important and daunting, is not only about doing the work, but it's about cracking you open so that future you can call you forth. Yes. There's a, fu a future version of you is the next level of you and when you do the hard things that's what opens you up and uh and allows that next best version to be called forth and i think the third truth which we've talked about a little bit in the in the last segment was to say be the person who reaches out because um people are lonely and people welcome somebody who reaches out and says hey how are you how can i help yeah, you know, I'm here. That is a powerful gift to give people. Mm, that's beautiful. I would acknowledge you, Michael, for your your wisdom and your ability to communicate clearly and effectively and be curious enough to ask these questions for yourself on how to be a better communicator, a better friend, a better lover, a better coach, and all these different areas. And taking this information and simplifying it for the rest of us. Because I think a lot of people struggle. They are lonely because they don't have the skills and tools 
to communicate better. So I acknowledge you for putting this together, creating this work, sharing it with us here, and being of service to humanity. I really appreciate it. Because, you know, so much of what you're about is how do I be of service? You know, that's kind of what I sense is yeah. at the heart of this. And I'm like, so what's the question that's of service to them? You know, yeah. part of the success of the Coaching Habit book is, um, you know, a question like, what's the real challenge here for you? That's one of the questions there is kind of, 